This episode is brought to you by Missouri. Most people only think about buying jewelry for special occasions, but Missouri believes you should celebrate every day, not just the big moments. That you should buy and wear jewelry whenever you want. With responsibly sourced diamonds and 14 karat solid gold styles for every budget, Missouri has something for everyone. They even drop new limited edition products every Monday, so it's easy to find something you'll love and wear forever. Shop now at Missouri, M E J U R I dot com. Before investing with RBC, I'll be honest, I was nervous. Where do I begin? Was it the right time? Do I even have enough to start investing? With RBC, I realized that, yeah, I did have enough. Because you can get started with just a few dollars a week. And the tools and expertise I get with RBC made it easy. Turns out, I couldn't afford not to invest. Learn more at rbc.com slash start investing. Need a break during your gaming session? Take an ice cold Coke break. So you can get back in the zone. Pause, refresh, keep playing with Coke. Click or tap to find out more. Age of Radio. Takahashi. Ishiro-san, as I live and breathe. And you do I mean, both well, my friend. Well, sometimes I'm up to like two packs a day, so... Oh, but, uh, oh geez. Oh. Nice thing is you can still smoke everywhere here in the late 80s. And that will never change. Never, ever. You know, I hear it's actually good for you. I I hear that all the time, but b- big media doesn't want us to know. I don't want you to know. I've done my own research, and I know these things. That's how you gotta be. Exactly. So, uh... So I, I've actually been kind of bereft of ideas for uh, for, a, for a new movie to make. I, I don't. I got nothing. I know, but you know what? I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Takahashi, forget movies. I mean, we've done so many movies. Let's just make a commercial. Oh my God! I have just been hit with a stroke of genius. Oh, well, that, that's the best kind of stroke. It is the best kind of stroke. And I like that one I had back in 84. That was, that was terrible. Bad. That was bad. That was awful. Um, What I'm thinking is that we make a movie that is essentially a commercial. I'm listening. It's filled with nothing but, but product placement. Now, what I'm thinking is that they're... Uh, that their new uh, 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 Nintendbot machine, my kid's got one, he loves it. Oh, right, my kids want a Super Nintendbot, and I'm like, I'm not made out of money. No, in fact, we gotta, we gotta make, we gotta spend the money to make the movie in order for us to make the money, in order for us to have the money for them to buy it, but then we gotta put that money into the next movie. That's right, that's our theory. Except, you, well, you, that, that, that's you take what, the money you make, and you yep. put it all back in. That's exactly what Menahem and Yoram taught us. That's and that's what you got to do. You can't do. You got to. And so we get uh, what I'm thinking is with this Nintendbot thing, they um, I hear they got a new uh, that there's uh, Super Luigi Cousins game coming out, Part Three, I think it is. I think so in 3D. Yes. I, I and we get we get them to get on board, and we'll make the whole movie. Uh, around that, and uh, maybe we can rip off like a, you know, a, another like a way better movie like Rain Man. Oh, that movie's hilarious! I could not stop laughing. The way he abused his brother with autism, hilarious! It was one of the funniest things they put out that year. Oh, oh, oh! Could we get the Wonder Years kid? I think it goes without saying. He is, he is, uh, he is, his Q rating is high right now. And uh, he probably loves the Nintendo Bots. Every kid loves the Nintendo Bots. And and we need an adult. So if I may <laughs> offer, our favorite bridges, the best one, Bo. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you 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 you're gonna make a movie. You're gonna, what are you gonna do? Put Jeff? I mean, pff, what's he done? Who's I'm he not made? making an Elvis TV movie from the '70s. Right? That's ridiculous. Oh, so- that's Kurt Russell. You know, they all look alike to me. Is that racist anyway. to say? I don't think so. I think it's I think it's all right because uh, they all do look alike. <laughs> okay, <laughs> white people. So, uh, anyways, uh, we we got those guys, and I'm thinking maybe we get um, get that Slater kid. He tests really well with the teenage girls who don't play video games. See, this way, if we've got him, the teenage girls are gonna come see the movie. 
Then we got uh, the the Wonder Years kid. Uh, all the kids are gonna want to come see that. Plus, it's got the Nintendo bots in there. Right. We get we get the we get the Super Luigi Cousins game, uh, in there. We get the, that their Ninja Gaiden game that they got. So we got ninjas and stuff in there. We got ninjas and, and Mario Cousins or Luigi Cousins and 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 bridges. I think some Zeldas. I we we have to. Yeah. That way that way, that way it it appeals to to the women audience as well, not mm-hmm. just the teenage girls. So we get all that. Cram it. I mean, sledgehammer it. Not even shoehorn, but sledgehammer all that stuff into a Rain Man knockoff. And then we put that into theaters. You know what happens then? That's when the money rolls in. You know when I pick a movie. That's when I'm on to press her now. The question always comes back to me. What will they think? Welcome, 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 everybody, to What Were They Thinking? A podcast about bad to questionable movies. Um, hmm, not sure about this week's, though, but we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, I, of course, am your host, Nathan, and with me, as always, is the Jimmy to my Corey, Brendan. How you doing, bud? I'm pretty... Oh, wait, I mean, you I'm could, pretty good. Could, yeah, you could stop doing that. Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> You got, you got stuck in uh, Takahashi mode. Uh, yeah, well, Ishiro San, really. Ishiro, sorry, yeah. Ishiro. Mode. I mean, they are very different characters. We should, we should absolutely, really, yeah, yeah, drawn out with such uh, rich backstories. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, less than uh, in a lot of good movies. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, always glad to have a, a guest on the show, and. Mm. Uh, How's that other, uh, you know, that that show that you do, uh, you know, with the uh, with the that that whore of a home wrecker? Oh wow! Okay, we're gonna go here already. We're just <laughs> we're just getting right on this. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we just uh, we just talked about uh, at the time of this recording, we just talked about the Hitchcock movie Rebecca. So we're doing pretty good. Oh, okay, cool. All right. <laughs> well, I think we fared better with this one though, myself. I mean, because uh, we talked about the, we're talking about the wizard. We watched of Oz. Uh, no, not of Oz. No. The 1990, 89 movie. 89, yeah. Uh, with Fred Savage and Jenny Lewis and Bo Bridges and and Christian Slater and Sam McMurray and and Tobey Maguire out of nowhere like an RKO. Very briefly, and I don't think he speaks. No, he doesn't. He just kind of he just kind of stands in the background and. But he and, and does grins. have a kick-ass mullet. He does, as most people did back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The uh. The, yeah. The 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 Super Mario Brothers three commercial called the Wizard. It really uh, is. But <laughs> just, I you know, I will say this. Every like people will say that it's it's just a commercial for Super Mario Brothers 3. Really, it's just a commercial for Nintendo because you don't find out until, su- until the end of the movie that Super Mario Brothers 3 is there. Mm. Uh, but you get to see all the other games that they had. Ninja Gaiden, uh, Zelda, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Rad Racer, just Double Dragon, a plethora of games. I believe they said 97 at one point. That That's how many... I don't. Know, I think Nintendo may have more games than that, but like those were the official ones. It it does feel like at some point though. It does feel like in some way though. Like if there was a shortened version of this, just the leading up to the tournament with Super Mario Three, this might be something they show at like a convention to like introduce that a new game is coming out. Like this little mini movie. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. This this actually like that that last <laughs> section of the competition feels like a presentation from like E3 or Gamescom or something like that. A hundred percent. Like, like um, not, not a, not a feature film that would be in theaters. No, no. But, uh, well, I'm going to explain to everybody how this actually is a feature film because, mm. plot. uh, it's a story about, uh, two brothers, uh, half brothers. If you want to get all technical about it, uh, Corey and Jimmy Woods, uh, who Jimmy Woods, Jimmy Woods, mm. Yeah. 
That's yeah. I thought the same. <laughs> like I, I sure hope not. Uh, well, he doesn't. He, he he This kid actually doesn't talk all that much. So yeah, I can't. That be way that you know you know it's not him. Um. So uh, they go on a cross country adventure uh, to get uh, to California. Uh, along the way, they meet a girl named Haley who persuades them to go to the video game competition because along the way they find out that old Jimmy is a savant when it comes to video games. Uh, this movie is just a sheer Rain Man knockoff from beginning to end as far as the story goes. Um, uh, of course, you know, the parents have to go looking for the kids. Um, they send a uh, quote-unquote kid catcher to find the kids. And hilarity ensues? I will say right away, to be fair... To be fair, no. you just want Rain- to get it out of the way. I do. I just want to say it early. <laughs> Rain Man did come out in uh, 1988, so maybe yeah. they didn't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> it seems uh, pretty brazen. <laughs> Their similarities are too great. They, I mean, yeah, but uh, <laughs> I'm just benefit of the doubt. I don't know. Okay. But oh well, well you know what? Let's uh, let's get to it. We open on a desert highway with a young boy walking towards us in the distance to what can only be described as you two when you order them from wish <laughs> I, I i wrote down that this was like i thought i was watching that shot in lawrence of arabia oh because the heat waves <laughs> well where the guy is like off in the distance and the, mm. the shot just stays until he fully comes into the scene it's like oh, okay. five minutes long or whatever <laughs> yeah i was like is this how long are we gonna watch this child walk in the desert well you got you you, you paid for that u2 knockoff you gotta use it right yeah, so after we hear Z4, what happens? <laughs> well, we get a low-flying plane that apparently buzzes the kid. Now, if this kid is autistic, which I believe he is meant to be on the spectrum because there are a lot of things that are about his character that tell us that, I feel that there would be some auditory issues that would happen if a plane flew this low to the poor kid. I yeah. think he would have actually had a, an absolute total nervous breakdown if that had happened yeah i don't know why they feel the need to north by northwest this kid i know just 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 so they can say uh we saw him he's out on this highway you better uh you know send the send the sheriff and then the sheriff comes out uh to pick him up and ask him where he's going he says he wants to go to california that's a great kid everybody wants to go to california my wife wants to go to california they put him in the truck, and apparently the lady working dispatch is also an expert in exposition. <laughs> because she's like, you got to take him to his mom's place. The parents are divorced. And it's like, you know, you, you, we could have just, we, you could have just let that happen, and we would have saw it happen. Any more of the story you want me to narrate, officer? Yeah, he's getting really reamed on the alimony pants. <laughs> She owns half of his landscaping business. Did I mention he has a landscaping business? <laughs> I think your radio's broken, Doris. <laughs> so uh, they, uh, of, of course, they uh, mom is remarried, um, and uh, Jimmy is living with her. Uh, we then flash forward to a, uh, I don't know, like a. It's he. He's he goes. He's not in an institution just yet he goes to like a um an adjusted learning center uh for kids who have been on the spectrum i don't even know if they don't even they even say it once in the movie but the kid has he's got delays and but he's got he builds like structures and uh he's very nonverbal. he's got he doesn't make a whole lot of eye contact all that stuff is just indicative of him being on the spectrum quite shocked that this 1989 movie doesn't mention one particular Autism. word. Well, oh yeah, that was uh, they they settled with. I think they settled on freak and weirdo. Yeah. So I mean, I guess the the safer of the bunch. I want to talk a minute about uh, the painting of Momo that's on the on the wall of the the psychiatrist's office or therapist's office because there's, there's like a painting of what looks like a I don't know like a dog dinosaur, but it's it's painted completely black and the word it's either momo or nomo written in a scrawl that can only be described as something out of like insidious or sinister okay 
terrifying. Ter- I want I want that kid's movie. I want to see his story or her <laughs> story or their story if we're if I'm going to be inclusive. Exactly. Um, we get to meet the uh, the mom and uh, her husband, played by Sam McMurray. Sam McMurray, when you need a yuppie sleaze bag in a movie. Yeah, I was actually shocked that it didn't go the full mile with with that spoiler alert and just have like a reunion of the parents. But yeah, he was uh, he he was he was immediately he's like, oh hello everyone, I'm going to be the unlikable character. Yeah, uh, and he's like. He's like, we've been sending him here for I don't know how long, and nothing's happened. I think we need to put him in a home. Just so you know, he's the guy to root against for this entire thing. And even kind of mom, too, because she's complacent in most of that stuff. But he's not even the least likable person. Spoiler alert. Absolutely (laughs) not. And I've got some stories about one of the characters who's even more less likable in real life. Uh Uh-oh. We'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, we, we then cut to, uh, Corey and, uh, well, Sam, the dad, Corey and Nick, um, they're, you know, I guess Sam will be Jimmy's dad. Corey and Nick are the half brothers. They are all living separate. And, uh, and just like every other eighties comedy or sitcom dads are idiots who can't do anything. You can't cook a casserole guys. Yep. And uh, and he's constantly fighting with uh, with his kids uh, because they you know we get Corey saw Jimmy earlier today although we didn't see that no although we were treated to like again five minutes of Jimmy just walking in the desert gotta pad that runtime baby yeah but don't put in scenes that actually might make sense <laughs> no. and there, there's actually a whole bunch of stuff right in this section where they jump through time so much because. They had this argument about, um, you know, about, you know, Jimmy going into the home. Uh, Corey doesn't want it to happen because he's got a he's I got a closeness, I guess, with his half brother. They're about they're only a few years apart. Uh, his older brother Nick wants to look out for him, but Corey got has he's got some animosity towards Nick because we find out Jimmy had a twin sister who passed away, and Nick was. Not necessarily responsible, but he wasn't. He uh, he wasn't really watching uh, Jimmy and Jennifer. That's his his uh, the sister uh, as closely as he could have been, and poor and poor Jennifer uh, drowned. And uh, Jimmy saw it all happening to him. Now they don't come out right out and say that you know it was the trauma that made him, but they do they do hint at the idea that the trauma actually pushed him to this nonverbal state without actually saying it because again yeah. autism wasn't a new thing at the time but it certainly wasn't a thing that was well explored or talked about at Cer- the time certainly not in movies no that's for sure uh he they just would have given them the you know the r label and been done with it more than mm-hmm. likely in most other movies in, the, in this in this day and age or that day and age rather um, so, okay, so, Corey blames Nick for that, uh, of course, we get, like, some, uh, some fights between, uh, Nick and, and the, and Dad that kind of, I felt like they just happened in a day, but apparently we're meant to believe that a bunch of time has passed because the next time we see, uh, we hear Corey or see Corey rather, and hear Nick and Sam fighting. Jimmy's in already in the um, the institution they were going to put him in, and Corey's is fed to the teeth with all this argument, and he's going to bust Jimmy out. But where are they going to go? Well, I better start throwing some darts at the map. He did not want to go to Alabama. That was that, that was crazy. I I actually wrote down this part at this point like, hey Fred Savage, who plays Corey by the way, and has some wonderful eyebrow acting. Uh, it's not picking a random state anymore when you do, you do it like four times and you're like, oh yeah, okay, that one. <laughs> <laughs> like he finally lands on California. And he's like California. But I mean, there were, and we get all this stuff through like exposition uh, about how they, uh, when they were still a family, when Jennifer was still alive, that they would go out to 
um you know they would go out to california and stop at every rinky dink tourist trap along the way and yeah. and all that sort of stuff so there's a lot of there's a lot of voiceover and exposition that um that that we kind of get um here and even just a little bit later on too so that we can kind of fill in some of the the cracks in the in the story because if we didn't there would be ones that you could drive trucks through wouldn't it be great though if all the voiceover and exposition was done by daniel stern <laughs> so not only is it a Nintendo commercial, it's an extended like Wonder Years. Would he be? Would that be? He'd be like, he'd be like, uh, oh, Fred. Sa- he'd be Kevin's like kid at that point. Yeah. And Bo Bridges would be Kevin. <laughs> Kevin Arnold. <laughs> Hell yeah, let's do it. it, it who looks not? It, Bo Bridges looks nothing like Daniel Stern. <laughs> Not in the slightest. No. Um, okay. So, anyways, uh, all right. So he's he figures out. All right. I'm I'm going to I'm gonna break Jimmy out, and we're gonna run away to California. Uh, so we, we he 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 breaks into the institute, and when I say breaks into the institute, he just undoes undoes the latch on the front fence gate. He literally walks in, and by the way, every single child. In that institution is watching the exact same TV program. Did you notice that? And it was like I did. It was like people like shooting at each other and stuff. It was like a war documentary or like, something. What should you should they be watching that if they're like prone to like loud noises and stuff? I I think the uh, the attempted commentary there is that kids who are in institutions like this aren't really looked after. They're just uh, put in place to be placeholders, and then uh, you know the institute collects the money sort of thing mm. you know real strong social commentary from a nintendo commercial <laughs> right all right and uh after he managed to, to <laughs> sneak past the crack security system at the institute uh he gets um he gets jimmy out and they uh they duck into the back of like a wonder bread slash twinkies truck and to which i say in this this is a, a home for kids who are on the spectrum. Now, they might not have been talked about in TV and movies at the time, but doctors were aware of it at the time. And they knew that the kids like this have a tendency to wander off. You would think they would have a better security system than a latch on a gate. Right. But and apparently they didn't even need it either, though, because they, they snuck into the back of the hostess truck. And it's already that on top of like the Dairy Queen advertisement earlier. I was just like, this is just a commercial. Surely it could get any more shameless than this. This is just un unbelievable. Then you see when they get to the bus depot that there's all that Chevrolet stuff. Right. And that's as bad as it gets. That's as bad as the worst as it gets. Oh, man. Uh, of course, um, you know, the, because Jimmy's gone missing, the parents kind of you know circle the wagons and uh we meet mr putnam who is a kid catcher yeah and looks kind of like a kid catcher he he looks but he's not the cast member who ended up being a kid catcher we'll get to that when we get to that what (laughs) he says that he retrieves runaways professionally and i was like no (laughs) nope don't like it (laughs) you know what they should have just went with private investigator well, yeah. Why does he have to be a runaway retriever? Why does he have to be a kid catcher? He also because yeah. like his job is specifically children. It's not just like a private yeah. a private investigator for everything. Like he's like my specialty is catching kids. Um, he like like a villain. not something you put on a business card. Yeah, he's like a villain in that Frankie Muniz movie. <laughs> right. I'm assuming that's what that movie's about. What big fat liar? Oh, catch that kid. Oh, catch that kid. All oh, right. <laughs> He's also like he also goes right up to Bo Bridges and says, "Hey, basically, don't get in my way of grabbing this kid, or I don't get paid." I mean, and, and Bo Bridges at one point says, "You make money off of kids, you sick." I'm like, "Yes, thank you, Bo Bridges." <laughs> uh, we get a montage of Corey and Jimmy making their uh, flight to California at one point, riding a skateboard down the Utah highway. Yeah. Can you do that? I mean, just sit on a skateboard and ride down the Utah Highway. Stephen Izzy, get at us on this one. Yes, yeah, Stephen Izzy, let us know how often you skateboard on the Utah Utah Highway, or how they often they don't skateboard. You s- they ride on the skateboard. They sit down and 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 coast along with them. They're not pushing foot. How would that even work? Jimmy sat in the front. 
Corey stood in the back like a fucking dog sled and kept his his uh, hands on Jimmy's shoulders. Okay, cars would be like, get the fuck out of my way. One of the cars out, goes out around them, and it's a fucking truck. Yeah. <sighs> oh, Anyhow, they make their they make their stop uh, for the night, and uh, they're, Corey's reading the map, and we get that fun little uh, thing where he's riffing on the names of the the of the places, Goblin Valley. Is uh, he's like it's always Goblin Valley or Death Valley. Why is it? Why is it? Can't, why is it always gonna be that? Why can't it be like Happy Fun Valley or Sunshine Rainbow Valley? It's like you know, Corey, fucking save it for your two minutes, all right, and use it on on open mic night. They, they were like, hey kid, hey kid, you want? Could, could you could you riff for a bit? Could you just riff? <laughs> Can I? I'm on the Wonder Years. <laughs> I was in Little Monsters with Howie Mandel. I'm- Do I know how to riff? I'm one of the few child actors that grew up normal. Ah. <laughs> ah, well, he's been in trouble recently. Oh, no. Yeah, actually, he got kicked off of the Wonder Years reboot. Wait, is he the cast member? He No, he no, he's not. He oh. was uh, he was an executive producer, uh, but his his thing was, I guess he got um, he was he got handsy with oh. uh, but they were adults. I mean, still, it's bad, but it 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 could be way worse. Yeah. That's disappointing. Uh, right. Um, so they uh, they get to the bus depot and they don't have the money for bus fare because it's like two hundred bucks to get from Utah to California on the bus and they've got twenty seven dollars. And uh, Corey leaves Jimmy to play Double Dragon. He gets a little upset because oh shit, I, we don't have enough money. We got to figure some stuff out. He goes to grab Jimmy uh, and sees that the cops are there out out front. And they're like, oh, she's like, shit, we got to book it because the cops are looking for us because we're runaways. And just as he's leaving to, to kind of duck in the back to get hide from the cops, he sees that um, uh, old Jimmy had got 50,000 points on Double Dragon, which uh, where he was at when the game finished, when Corey grabbed him, apparently is a mathematical impossibility. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's all kinds of stuff in this mo- in this fucking movie that uh, in the uh, the stark light of adulthood makes me very upset. Well, it's so funny because this movie, like you said, is basically a Nintendo commercial. But yeah. there are so many moments where I was like, I'm not sure, but I don't think that's right. <laughs> yeah. Especially when we get to later on with Bo Bridges saying stuff. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about, Bo Bridges? Some of the stuff that he actually says is accurate to the game that he's playing maybe not where he's at in the game when we see the screenshots so at least they had that um but jenny uh that's sorry not jenny uh Haley is there uh, played by jenny lewis and she sees that Corey and jimmy duck off so she goes to see what's going on with them she's also introduced reading cosmo she yeah i she's uh her her character is of this this young girl who is putting on airs of being, uh, I don't know, wise beyond her years or mature beyond her years. Mm-hmm. When, when in reality we find out much later that it's all just a, a con on right. her part. Yeah. Um, they Corey manages to kind of swindle her into a, a, a bet, uh, playing uh, Jimmy against in, in uh, playing against Jimmy rather in Double Dragon. Um, and she's like, yeah, sure. And he needs like, he doesn't, he doesn't ask for like you know an exorbitant amount of money. He needs the six dollars that he needs to get to the Utah border. Right, right. She's like, I don't have that. He's like, Well, we'll cash in your bus ticket. And so they go and they play. And uh, again, Haley, I think she ended with a, a score of twenty five thousand and fifty points. Jimmy then picks up, and the first screenshot we see is him with twenty eight thousand points. But then we get him playing. We get him playing for like three or four more screenshots, and then Corey finally goes, "That's it, I win." It's like, dude, you won. You had won after the first screenshot. Why did? You, why do we have to continue on with this? <sighs> That's filmmaking, baby. That is filmmaking. Um, Sam and uh, Nick. They are now, uh, they are in hot pursuit because, as we said, Putnam, Sam will be cold dead in the ground before Putnam brings back his sons. Um, He was going to leave Nick at home, but then when he realizes, oh, it's on like Donkey Kong, because this is a Nintendo movie, Mm -hmm. uh, he needs to take 
he needs to take Donkey Kong Jr. along with him. And so they go, and uh, Christian Slater wakes up, and Bo Bridges is eating donuts for breakfast, and he, he's like, what are you eating? He's like, donuts. He's like, for breakfast? That's disgusting. And then he's like, says the guy who steals my truck and goes out drinking, that's a compliment. I'm like, what does one have to do with the other in this dialogue? Alcohol is meant to be drank, drank at a, in a nighttime setting. I don't know how that's disgusting than more disgusting than eating donuts first thing in the morning. But the stealing of the truck. Uh, that's disgusting. Okay. You're going to sure. make me sick. All right. Don't vomit. <gasps> it, this will be your Hollywood home. So. Hurt. <laughs> uh, okay. So here's the thing. After they have their little, little tet- that back and forth between Sam and Nick, we cut back to the kids. And uh, Jimmy is playing Ninja Gaiden. And she's going, he's on his second way through. And he hasn't even taken a hit yet. As we're looking at a screen that clearly displays that he is taking two hits at least. Okay. I used to love this movie. <laughs> now I'm putting it on blast. And we get our we get our title because she, after she says that she said, "He's a wizard." Ba ba ba. Just like Chris Jericho. <laughs> a wizard. He's a wizard, and is that a AEW reference? Yeah, it's that's oh. one of his new things. Okay. He threw a he threw a fireball, like you know the the paper thing that Hulk Hogan failed to do with the Warrior at Halloween Havoc '98. He did that to somebody, and then he cut a promo like a week or two later where he's talking about I throw fireballs. I'm a wizard. <laughs> it's great, brilliant stuff. <laughs> uh, so at this point. Uh, Putnam shows up, right? And he go and what creeped me out is he goes up to like the cafe, the woman working at the cafe, and, and says, he's smoking the entire time. And he actually, says, no, it's not. He puts he puts a cigarette out right there in the <laughs> ashtray that she's cleaning. So. He says, "Hey, sweetheart, I'm looking for some kids." <laughs> yikes! Big yeah. yikes right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she should have been like, I don't know what kind of place you think that this is. But get out or I'm calling the cops. <laughs> what do you got on the menu, sweetheart? <laughs> Oh, we did fail to mention uh, in the previous scene where the kids were playing Ninja Gaiden uh, or Ninja Gaiden. Uh, Haley comes up with the idea that to put Jimmy in the video game championships, uh, Video Armageddon, uh, under the idea that if he wins Video Armageddon, they won't put Jimmy in a home. Right? They'll be like, he's really good at video games. Clearly, we we must honor him and and elect him king. <laughs> right? I don't know where her reasoning is on that. And the prize, by the uh, way, is fifty thousand dollars. That's a lot of that's a lot of cabbage. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for a video I'm game like, tournament, especially nineteen eighty nine. I mean, now you can get, you can get you know millions, but you have to be in esports and play all day. And, yeah, you know, you gotta if you be got a mortgage and a couple of kids. You can't dedicate your life to that. Apparently, you got to become best friends with Xavier Woods. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. Um. So okay. Sam and uh, Nick somehow uh, were hot on the heels of Putnam, despite the fact that they had to turn around because they were going the wrong way in the last scene we saw them at. The entire movie they are. Right. He sees them go in. uh, They're going to go get some food. uh, Putnam, he sneaks out and deflates the the tires, or or slashes the tires, rather, on on Bo Bridges' truck. And (laughs) Bo Bridges... (laughs) catches him doing it runs after him he's got this little tiny knife that he's gonna fight bo bridge i think bo bridges could take him this could just because of how small the guy is and how flimsily that knife is but bo bridges isn't having that he backs off for a minute goes and gets a shovel and starts just beating the holy hell out of putnam's car breaking lights breaking mirrors my question is why didn't he go for the windshield uh my question is, how did he make it through this whole movie without getting arrested? Oh, there's he committed so he much aggravated clear. assault. So, like, and, and just uh, and between the two of them, actually, on minors sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so Putnam speeds away, but not before <laughs> you know, old Sam does a shovel javelin, like oh, like just throws it like he's in the Olympics and and misses wildly, Imagine if he had done that and there was just a shot of it going like through Putnam's skull. 
this movie would have taken a, a way darker but awesome turn. Rated R, the, only for that one scene. Yeah, I don't think they would have got the PG rating that they were rushing <laughs> no. for. No. <laughs> uh, so, all right. <sighs> but then the kids hitch a ride with a... Uh, Oh in, a, in a trailer, uh, in, in the back of a, of a of a truck with a bunch with a bunch of cows in it, and and Corey asks Haley, "How are you sure we can trust these guys?" And she's like, "I know my dad's uh, my uh, my mom. I'm sorry, my dad's a trucker, and uh, truckers they have a code." And I'm like, "Is she talking about the trucker code or the code of the highway that George Carlin was talking about in Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back because this is going to take a really bad turn if that's the code she's talking about. Yeah, if that kid catcher comes back, game over. Yikes. <laughs> it's at this point where we find out that uh, Haley's mom, quote-unquote, packed it in. Mm-hmm. I think it's her, it's her euphemism for her mom died. Yeah, but don't, I thought she just left. I see. I thought she died. Okay, maybe. You know, probably. Wouldn't. Either way, depressing. Yeah. Oh, and it gets worse. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, because the uh, the truckers who have a code apparently see these. Uh, let's see. I think were they eight and eleven and twelve? I think are the yeah. ages. They see their kids counting their singles and decide they're gonna rip them off. They have twenty seven bucks all told. And the, these guys are gonna rip them off. Like man, oh, you, they are they are on the same tier as uh, the truckers from Supergirl. <laughs> yeah, they rob a bunch of children for twenty seven dollars. Right. Yeah, and ki- and kick them off and leave them in the middle of nowhere to die. You and leave, there was at one die. point where Corey drops the money so Haley can grab it. The guy who's accosting her. Then reaches down to grab the money. She could have clearly kicked him in the throat. Mm-hmm. And this again, this movie would have taken a way more interesting turn. But no, he just kind of fends her off and takes the twenty bucks and leaves them sitting on the side of the highway. Right. Yeah. Uh, but they do manage to. I guess they manage to make it to. Uh, well, they do manage to make it safety. Uh, because we see them playing um, Super Mario Brothers 2, or as I like to call it, The Greatest Lie Ever Told. <laughs> I love that game. fucking hate that game. I love it. Oh, it's not even a Super Mario Brothers game. Doesn't bother me. It's Doki Doki Panic with Mario skins put over top of it. I don't... Ugh. I think it's mm. I think it's fun. I like how different it is. But I do like uh I I do think this is the least realistic part of the movie and when in which when they go into the to the next place and there's an arcade machine, all these middle aged businessmen playing. Well, they're supposed to be traveling salesmen, I guess. Yeah, and I'm like fuck you, yeah, fuck off. And that's the thing. At this time, yes, that's a situation where you're like, Oh, you know, piss off because when Nintendo was kind of break making big in the late 80s, video games were, were then kind of relegated back to being seen as stuff that was for kids. Yeah. However, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, video games were actually seen as more of an adult thing because you would find them in like bars and uh, you know hotel lounges and stuff like that where Pac-Man and Donkey Kong and stuff, they were, they were played by people in their 20s and 30s. So there were adults who would play those games. I feel it would be more realistic if these guys had been playing one of those games as opposed to, uh, fuck, what were they playing? I don't even know. I can't even remember. I just remember that they hustled the, um, they hustled them out of a bunch of money. They hustled them out of the money while, uh, new kids on the block play in the background. <laughs> Cause that don't happens they... a couple of times in this movie. And when you said Mario two, I think this is when they cut to Christian Slater and, uh, and Bo Bridges in the in the in the area where they're getting their car fixed. Oh right, and yes, because, because he has to Christian's, get white walls. Yeah, because Christian Slater, when you see the shots of him with the controller, he is he has never played a video game before. <laughs> his button bashing is ridiculous, but not the like, worst what, button bashing. You don't button mash in Mario Two, right? Like, but, much, it, you it, there's it, it's a platformer. Your your button control is 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 paramount in a game and, like that, and not the worst. Uh, video game mo- uh, controller movement that we'll see in this movie. No, but actually, that worst video game movement control with controllers that we see in this movie is super fucking accurate for parents. 
We'll get to that when we get to that. Yeah. Okay. So the kids hustle these uh, these salesmen, um, and uh, then they kind of have to kind of hide out from like they spend the night in the junkyard, and we get a bonus video game without actually having a video game in Punch Out. Because Corey tries to scare Jenny, or sorry, Haley, yeah, and she just fucking hauls off and socks him because she's again she's putting on these airs that she's not afraid, because she is super afraid. Her dad is never home. She takes him on. He takes her on the road with him, and then sends him sends her home on the bus. So she's not always on the road. But then when you think about it, she's taking the bus across the country alone, going. To home alone, she doesn't have paint cans. But thankfully, Daniel Stern and Joe Pesci are not attacking her because <laughs> that would be terrible. Well, no, Daniel Stern wasn't attacking her because he's too busy narrating the movie. Exactly. Uh, so I mean, she there's a lot of stuff going on with her that, as a kid watching this movie, I never really got. Yeah. And then again, watching it in the cold light of adulthood, I'm like, fuck. People like CPS should be notified about what's going on with Haley because that poor little girl needs a stable home environment. I do think it's funny though. Uh, it does, it does make me laugh that he puts on a, a spooky mask and tries to scare her and her, and she doesn't budge, but she does just punch him in the face. Like yeah, she <laughs> we get to see him the next day putting, he's there. He's got a big black eye and stuff like that. And they hitch a ride with bikers. Yeah, that was weird. And they they were super cool about, it. and it's um, interesting, tidbit, mm-hmm. uh, because the tidbit is interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is actually a uh, a collective amongst bikers who will go to court with children, uh, when they are uh, have to be witnesses against, um, you know, adults who may have you know touched them inappropriately, so that the kids don't have to feel intimidated. They'll go and they'll stay with the kids. So the kids got these big burly protectors with them and they don't have to be afraid of the person who hurt them so that they can have the confidence to get on the stand and say what happened uh, when, you know, Mr. Naughty Hands touched them. Oh, wasn't that what the show Sons of Anarchy was all about? Oh, my. I can't believe they never did that. They could have done that. That would would have been. It didn't have to be a whole season, but a great like a, a two episode arc would have been fantastic. I mean, anything's better than that season where they went to Ireland. <sighs> yeah, that was the season only... before. That was pretty great, though, wasn't it? That's my only real big criticism. Having watched that whole show, is like that mm. that most of the season when they were in Ireland, I was like, this is this is clown shoes. But everything else, you just checked out, eh? Yeah, yeah everything <laughs> else I liked, pretty much. Okay, yeah. Um, so they get a, they, they get a drive from bikers for a while, but Mm -hmm. then we see them hitchhiking. That can't end terribly. No, never. (laughs) Hitchhiking across, you know, (laughs) the Midwest, get little kids on deserted highways. We also see Putnam shaving his, making a point of shaving his mustache at one point. And I was like, oh, so he sees it too. (laughs) Like, it's not just you and I making jokes. Like, he actually sees He's like, you know what? I better take care of this. Maybe I should get another new set of frames, too. Oh, I do look like a kid catcher. (laughs) Uh, To the point where he... I think the reason why he did that was because he probably got in trouble for accosting those random kids. Right. Because he sees a couple of kids who he thinks are Corey and, and Jimmy. He just walks up to them and grabs them and turns them around. And the kids are like, what the fuck are you doing, man? And he's like, oh, oh, no, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. Yeah. Better go shave this mustache. <laughs> boy, oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we did get a, a fun, I thought this, I, I think this is an Easter egg to uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but I might be I might be reaching because we see the kids, they catch another ride uh, with some folks in a, in a truck uh, in the back, but they're sitting with some some na- there are some native folks who are just kind of sitting there, and the kids are staring at them. The natives are staring back, and they're just staring at them. And uh, Jimmy just goes, "Hi," like the uh, you know the, the the chief who never talked at one flew over the cuckoo's nest, and then says something at the end. I that's what I thought they were. That's what I thought they were shooting for. Does he actually again, say anything in the movie? He does. Or, or I thought that he, was he just talks, a Simpsons joke. No, no, he talks a couple of. Oh, oh, you mean the the. The chief, you mean? Oh, yeah. From one flew over. Yeah. 
I thought he did. I thought he talked at the end of the movie. I could be wrong. I it's been a gajillion years. All right, so uh, they 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 actually do make it to another uh, diner, and Corey and and Haley uh, they're hustling these teenagers, and uh, the kids don't they don't feel too well t- uh, taken to being beaten by the a little kid, uh, and, but before they, they they can beat up Corey and and Jimmy, uh, this lady comes out who I can only describe as delightful. Mm, the cafe and owner. She, yeah, and she's like, she's like, you two again, eh? Do I have to spell it out for you? Roger! Roger! <laughs> she starts yelling. The, they're back, and the, the kids kind of shuffle off where they have to deal with Roger, and then she starts just rambling about, like, I got video game monsters, and I got graffiti monsters, movie and I got monsters. Uh, movie monsters. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, one of the craziest characters in the entire movie. She's only got this one little spot, but it's so memorable because she's just, like, having a word salad with everything that she's saying. <laughs> Uh, so after this delightful lady has her bit of fame in this movie, um, there's a kid who's at the diner who says that, yeah, he's pretty good, but I don't think he's he's good enough to beat Lucas. Is this the cast member? This is the cast member. I no. had a feeling. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll yes. <laughs> we might as well get to it because uh, they then go out to, to meet this Lucas kid because he's going to these this video game championship um as well so they can kind of size up the uh his the opponent now flash forward years and years and i think this is like one of the only movies this this actor did but he got in trouble oh probably about a i don't know if it was a half a decade or a decade ago but he got he got jammed up for for doing some inappropriate stuff with kids <sighs> yeah yeah. Now I wonder if this was a cycle since he was a young child actor. I'm assuming he was abused as a child and abused See, that's, others. Like again, like it's one of those things. It's a possibility, but I don't. I don't. This is the only thing I know this guy from. But still, the fact that he. I mean, this was a big movie, right? Fair. Fair. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not, and I'm not certainly not saying, you know. This is his excuse, but I'm just saying, like, it happens. Could be part of the reason. It could yeah. be a con- contributing factor. Yeah. But Lucas right, well, is, a, is a real wizard. He's, he's a real whiz, that's for sure, and that whiz is also a way to say pee. Uh, he, uh, he touts the superiority of the power glove, and that goddamn thing was a scam. I love the power glove. It's so bad. And he means yeah, it's cool, so, but it but yeah, no. But it's really bad it's because really, the way he used it to like play that game, that was that was pre-rendered. There was no way he was playing that game. Also like the design is stupid. I to had begin a with. power glove. Yeah. No. Awful. Although I will say this, um the uh the power glove drunkenly stumbled so the Wiimote could run <laughs> because it's... that I mean Nintendo didn't didn't shy away from it they kept they kept trying to, to reinvent it um but the uh you know it, it took them until the Wii before they got that motion controller stuff just right but the power glove is so intimidating that Jimmy doesn't even want to play against Lucas and he t- takes off well wow. let's okay so after he says his immortal line i love the power glove it's so bad Corey then puts his arm around uh Haley and says you just keep your power gloves off her pal okay as if like that's his girlfriend now i guess i don't know that was the weirdest posturing yeah. even when i was a kid i was like why did he do that there's <laughs> been nothing to let me think that they're a boyfriend and girlfriend or he's interested in her or anything it's not your lady <laughs> right so and that's when jimmy kind of runs off um uh Haley then later kind of figures the reason why he didn't play Jimmy wasn't because he was in or sorry Jimmy doesn't play Lucas wasn't because he was intimidated by the power glove was because that he was he was jealous of her right because you know Corey put his arm around her and he was like you know he thought that you know someone else was taking his place with, with Corey I don't know something like that I, I will say this before we get too far, like, do we get past the power glove? 
Uh, I have did find out recently, probably in the last few years, that the Power Glove was actually supposed to be considerably more accurate and better. But Mattel got involved and wanted to make it as cheaply as possible. So all like the gyroscope stuff, all the stuff that they had ta- that they had they had you know kind of um, cutting edge technology that was put into the original design of the Power Glove was chucked for that like considerably cheaper alternative that they did. It had this thing you had to set it up on your TV, and it apparently worked with, like like uh, subsonic sounds that would come out of the Power Glove to, that would tell these sensors, which would plug into your Nintendo, where your power glove was in relation to the screen, and then would move your character accordingly. It didn't work. The only thing the power glove ever did was look kind of cool as an accessory. Right. That's it. I bought one of those things, 15 bucks at a flea market, and still felt ripped off. And also, considering that, I think it was like almost 100 bucks for the peripheral when it originally came out. Can you imagine... Your parents paying that, and then you play it, and you're like, "This thing sucks," and I'm never using it. But I can't let my parents know that. That's 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 the tough part, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <sighs> is this where they cut to? Okay, I know the scene is coming up because Christian Slater and Bowbridge are still on the road, and they cut to them staying at a hotel. Mm-hmm. Christian Slater has his road Nint- road Nintendo with him. Well, that's just- it was Corey's old one that he had fixed. And they're staying in the grossest fucking room. <laughs> it's just like when AJ Styles takes his PS4 on the road or whatever. Why not? Apparently he does. That's a good idea. He should just get a Switch. I mean, they're much more portable. I mean, I think he does probably have a Switch. He's a gamer, <laughs> right? Right. But um, he, he sets up his Nintendo. He plugs it in. Christian Slater's playing it for a bit. And then Bo Br- and then he wakes up in the morning to Bo Bridges playing it like a madman. And just the button bashing is so crazy. Like... <laughs> But he is playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and there are boss fights in that. But he's not in a boss fight. But there are boss fights in that movie, in that game, where you be button mashing. I'm assuming that though that you are talking more about the the flailing of the controller up, down, left, and right, like that is going to move his character around. I just think it's like I just think it's like bad video game playing acting that I see in so many no, movies. No, no, I will I will attest to this. As a kid who had original Nintendo and had friends who had the original NES. I have seen my parents and other friends' parents play Nintendo, and they invariably, every single one of them, play it, and then they start herking the controller to the left and up, or to the right and up, thinking that that's going to help their character jump better. Meanwhile, they're practically pulling the Nintendo off the shelf. Again... Parents, I think, helped in the development of the Wiimote. I don't think that <laughs> thinking went into this, though. I think Bo Bridges just grabbed the controller and was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. I, I, say, think, I, I think I you're will, giving them a bit of credit. <laughs> I was, if, if, if that's the case, it's a happy accident because I have seen parents play video games like that. And then the first of four million character breakup scenes... <laughs> we do like we do find out that this is where we found out that California was a tradition. Yeah, you're right. And this is the uh, the the drive-in scene because, um, and Jimmy, this is where Haley's like he was jealous. That's why he didn't want to play. And they don't really get too much time to to kind of um discuss that because the kids at the, the guys at the teenagers that they were hustling at the at the diner before remember with the the crazy lady with the video game monsters and the movie monsters and the graffiti monsters well they show up and they just start wailing on these kids too i, I was really shocked at how just i don't know laissez faire people were with like accosting preteens in the 80s i didn't know that that was a thing yeah they get assaulted several times <laughs> Yeah, uh, they get all their money taken from them. Um, they bust open uh, uh, Jimmy's uh, I just, lunchbox that he's carrying say, with him all the time. Yeah, I was going to say, I just called it a memory box. Yeah. It's and like the thing that Neil Breen has when he's a kid in <laughs> Faithful Findings. <laughs> right. Uh, they, they, and they take, his, they take the poor kid's hat. And this is where, you know, uh, Corey's like, that's it. I'm calling my parents. I'm going back to Utah. This is bullshit. 
we're stuck here. We've got no money. And then Haley gives him shit about quitting. They kind of both walk separate ways. As you said, character breaking up. And little Jimmy just goes, Corey, I don't want to quit. And they're like, yeah. And they, they, they freak out and run and talk. Like, he talked. And I was like, dude, he talked when you guys were in the truck with the natives. <laughs> he said hi. Yeah, why didn't you guys freak out then? Uh, Putnam questions more kids in an arcade and comes off like a real creep again. Oh my, it, it, But it's not the worst time he does it. Because all he does is he tilts this poor kid's uh, pinball game. Not cool. Not cool at all. <laughs> And then uh, Bo Bridges and Christian Slater are right there, and Bo rams his car, and that's when he—that's when oh he says God. to him, "He says to him, you make money off little kids. You ought to be shot." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just—they his truck gets absolutely trashed, uh, but Putnam does manage to to kind of get away. And then we we cut to the kids. Uh, they're in Reno uh, with Haley's friend Spanky. Who is shooting craps for them so they can make money so uh, Jimmy can practice Nintendo and get better so he can be ready for the video game Armageddon in California. Right. Yeah. Um, and he wins like 400 bucks for them before they kick him out of the casino with the kids. And she gives him $10. Little chiseler. <laughs> he did all the work. All the well, almost all the work. She was telling him how to bet, but still. And I mean, uh, I mean, he wouldn't have known what he was doing, though. Uh, okay, fair. I mean, she uh, was so like she was the rain man of that scene, <laughs> right? Like, it's incredible how accurate she was. Yeah. And also, well, did no one look to the side and say, "Hey, maybe we should kick that"? I know they do get kicked out eventually, but did no one before that look to the side and be like, "Can we get that kid out of here? That's basically gambling." <laughs> The one who's yelling to this adult and telling him how to bet. Yeah. Uh, and this is when, okay, so this is when they, they kind of get the big, um, uh, they, they kind of get the, the focus on, you know, Jimmy getting all, getting good. Get good, as they say today. Oh, how do and they? And they call the Nintendo hotline. I was just going to say, how do they get good at that? Oh, apparently, they take out a mortgage because that's what you would need to do with the amount of time they spend on the Nintendo hotline in this movie. So did they have a real hotline? I would, called it would... once. Did... I called it once when I was a kid and I couldn't sit down for a week. I knew the hotline was real. But did they have, like, did they actually have people on the line that would help you play the game? Yeah. Oh. That'd be a yeah, fucking like, awesome job. It, it, I, I guarantee you, it was, and they had like they had like binders like the stuff that you see in this movie, as far as the Nintendo Hotline goes, is very very accurate from what I've from what I've been told. I this, would like to go back in time and work there. <laughs> Just binders and binders of of uh, video games, not women, like Mitt Romney said. <laughs> Um, Mitt Romney would have won that election if he said he had binders full of video games. <laughs> binders full of video. He would have got the youth vote for sure, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, they they would get calls, and you'd say, "Hey, I'm having a problem with, um, uh, you know, Contra, Contra Two, you know." And they'd be like, "Well, where are you at? Have you put in the Konami code? Okay, this is what you need to do. This is where you can go. This is a strategy." And it was, I think it was like two bucks a minute. Like it was expensive, like, and the amount of money, the, the amount of time they spend on the phone with this guy, that I, I only, I can only assume that they stiffed the hotel they must on have. the room. <laughs> well, yeah, because like, yeah, they, they, I mean, they spend a whole montage worth of time. Yeah, we do get to see uh, a cigarette girl that is a that for in the arcade, who is like maybe a year older than Corey, who's walking around with a tray that she's selling licorice and soda pop, but she's dressed like a Vegas uh, a lounge waitress, which I was very uncomfortable with. I was going to say, there were multiple child employees in this place. Yes, yes. Child labor, apparently not a thing in Reno, Nevada in the, in the late 80s. No worries. It's America. Right. <laughs> we get another shot of Ninja Gaiden, Ninja Gaiden and... Every time I see that fucking game, I have post-traumatic flashbacks. Like that, it's a great game, but it is fucking punishingly hard. Oh, After, like as you get later into the game, it gets really, really brutally hard. One of the biggest piss-offs is that like the enemies would respawn, 
Uh, so if you killed something and got hit, but got hit by something else, that thing would knock you back, and then you would move forward again, and that enemy that you killed before was there again. Fun. Yeah, yeah. And birds that just swoop in and hit you mid-jump and knock you back and off a platform. <laughs> Ooh, Ninja Gaiden. Remember when you couldn't save games, guys? Oh, yeah. And hey, guess what? Uh, if you got a game and it sucked, there was no day one patch. You got it. It sucked. It sucked forever. No fixing it. None. Unless you're a PC gamer, I suppose. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh... Okay, so I'm the cigarette girls, right? Ninja Gaiden. We get another. We get another roadside confrontation with Putnam. This is where he has uh, Sam's truck towed away, doesn't he? Yes. And <laughs> just gone. Uh, he they have a but that happens while they're inside, uh, and they see a, the one of the the kids who accosted Corey and uh, Jimmy and and Haley at the drive-in wearing the woods landscaping hat and he's like that's his company's hat where'd you get that hat and they they they're they're gonna beat this kid up oh bow bridges is ready to assault a minor right but um <laughs> he's he does get stopped because uh lucas is, there. He, lucas is there to tell tell him where the kids are heading right and then he's like okay well we're gonna we're not gonna assault this kid we're just gonna take our hat back and leave and they go to go out and get in the truck and it's been towed away because lucas's motivation is that he's also going to the video game tournament and he knows how good jimmy is and if he can get right. jimmy out of there he'll do actually it. he doesn't know how good jimmy is but he's concerned he's with concerned how good jimmy he's, is. he's worried about jimmy being in that tournament yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah, their uh, truck is gonzo <laughs> right <laughs> And then they take it to the it gets taken to the junkyard. Okay, can we just get okay, into this for a second? One second before before we do that, because we, we do have that, but we do um, actually no. Go ahead, get into that. Yeah. No, okay, go I'm just gonna say it gets taken to the junkyard. First of all, Putnam just tells this guy, "I'll give you fifty bucks if you take this thing to the junkyard." I okay, fine, whatever. But then when it gets to the junkyard, they start just stripping it for parts. And their and their whole thing is like, well, the guy told us to take it. It was a wreck. Yeah, he said I'm it like, was a wreck, so I towed it away. But I'm like, so you just took the word of that guy? I don't know. It seems like this this it, junker is gonna end up in some legal hot water. There should have been, because he should have been like, because if Putnam was like, it's it's a junker, it's a wreck, I need you to tow it away. The first thing the guy says, do you have the registration papers for that? Right. And I, I guarantee you, fifty bucks is not worth not seeing the registration papers. <laughs> yeah, let's let's not get into that whole thing because we got, we got a movie to make here mm. that gets towed away and it's gets it's been stripped down. So they begin the large, the arduous task of rebuilding the truck. Ridiculous! The most unbelievable thing in this movie, outside of some of the video game screens that we see, and that's saying a lot. And that is saying a lot. Um. We then cut back to the kids who are apparently, I don't know, are they doing like side hustles, getting more money? Because they are just blowing money on stuff, on like, uh, you know, uh, fake eyeball things to put in like your drink and, and like Groucho Mars glasses and jackets and stuff like that. And it, it's just, I don't know what the purpose of this scene served. I don't know, but Putnam comes back at this point. Oh my god! And he finally <laughs> finds them because uh, some some woman tips him off. By the way, he goes up to some kid. Oh no! This is the oh my god! Yeah. This is the worst because he does. Yeah, he he he. First, he starts. At, he's asking around, and there's an old guy at the bar, at the pool where he's at, and I was traumatized. It's this old guy in a blue speedo. And when I say old, I mean your grandpa old and not your fit jacked grandpa old. I mean your, you know, Wilford Brimley aged and shaped grandpa old in a blue Speedo. Diabetes. And just uh, blue sack. That's that's all you could see. I, I was I was surprised I was able to take notes in this scene because I was too busy. Oh, I think you were going to say because you were too turned on. <laughs> I was far too hard to write notes down. I I thought you were gonna say the scene that this part that got you would because this this disturbed me is when he goes up to this kid and he's basically like shaking him down, 
asking, or you know, he finds Corey and he's like shaking him down, like, "Where's Jimmy? Where's well, yeah. Jimmy?" And Actually, this woman is like, the, "Oh, he's over before, at the arcade." Yeah, because before that, he's given this sob story. He's like, "Oh, have you seen these boys? One's my, they're my sons, and they're they've run away, and and, and one of them's got special needs, and I'm really, really worried to death." He sees Corey, turns around, and says. Where's your little freak brother? I've been looking all over you, little, little bastard. Where's your little freak of a brother? And, and the, the, the lady woman still he, helps him. Yes, the woman he just talked to witnesses all this. And still is like, this is a, a, a pillar of society that I'm helping. Even if she's still believing that the kids are his his sons, I feel at this point she should be like, you know what? I'm I'm going to alert security and possibly CPS because nobody is supposed to grab their kid and go, you little bastard, where's your freak brother? I've been looking all over you two, you little sons of bitches. But Putnam finds Jimmy and security does get alerted in a different way, Nathan. Oh, oh my god, they so do. I I I laughed as hard at this at forty four as I did at eleven. Mm-hmm. When she screams and points at Putnam, she being Haley, screams in the middle of a crowded casino as he has Jimmy lifted up and is carrying him out of the arcade, screams, he touched my breast. Yep. It's only then that security is like, well, we better get involved. (laughs) And Putnam is carted out by those cops. I think that those cops should have stepped in a little earlier because Jimmy's not exactly being super quiet about being picked up and carted out like a suitcase. I also think that um, Putnam maybe shouldn't have been able to get out that same day. No, of I jail. Really don't either. I, I don't. feel like there would be some more investigation. Well, here's the thing: he might have because if she had taken off, because they do take off after this, yeah. they would have been able to question her. They wouldn't have had a complaining witness. Still, though, <laughs> yeah, they would have had an, at least enough reason to hold them for 24 hours. Yeah, they would. Uh, we cut back to the truck is almost now completely repaired. But they're playing Nintendo. Uh, and Bo Bridges is absolutely obsessed uh, with uh, the Adventures of Link Zelda 2. He's like, I had the key and the cross and I was closing in on the Barbarian. Yeah, <laughs> he had beaten the River Demon and was closing in the Barbarian. Yeah. And he's like... We got to go. Christian Slater, like, Nick's like, we got to go. And uh, so he unhooks the Nintendo, but leaves the RF switch behind. The what now? The RF switch. It's the part that you had. See, back in uh, back in the 80s, kids, we had these things, these analog TVs that would have a, a cable port in the back. Oh, yeah, if yeah. you wanted to play your Nintendo, you had to run what is called an RF switch from your Nintendo to the back of your TV, and this would convert the the signal from the Nintendo so you could play it on either channel 3 or channel 4 is this the uh, of your red, analog yellow, television black cords? no this is a little box that would hook oh. into the, uh, the the that cable button in the back of your TV so the more you know and okay so after all that uh we she says we got a book we can't be here he knows we're here we're going to go to my place and this is where we find out what Haley's status in life really is all about her mom it's, was a gambling addict that's how she knows all about gambling specifically craps yeah um her this is where she says you know my you know she talks about her dad and that she wanted to do this video game thing because they were going to split the money and she was she would be able to say when he got home we can we can buy a house now we don't have to live in an rv trailer because it's not even like a, it's not even a mini home. It's it's like a it's like a, a one of those big caravan trailers that you'd see people you know driving down the highway with being hauled by like you know big trucks. And this is why when I moved into a mini home, people kept saying trailer. I was like, no, 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 that's a trailer. This is a mini home. There is a, there is a significant difference. Not a whole lot. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I can say that because my wife was my wife grew up in one. Um, <laughs> I I, uh, I think it's I think it's uh, extra creepy here when uh, Putnam is is uh, on the phone after he's been arrested. He's like touched her breast. She doesn't even have breasts. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think that makes it okay for you to put you for you to put your hand there. <laughs> and and also, I I can only imagine what the the person on the other end of the phone was thinking as he was saying this. Oof. Because he's on the phone when he says this, and she has not put him on hold. I don't believe. No. <laughs> um 
during the whole thing with uh, back at Haley's place uh, and her exposition and stuff like that, Corey makes like he's going to kiss her and she's like, don't you even think about it. Don't you even think about it. I knew what you were going to do and I would, I'll never kiss a boy. And Corey has that line of like, well, a girl maybe. And then she grabs him and kisses him and does like, I don't know, a good minute and a half of vamp acting with her feet. Mm hmm. She just he she flips her feet in and out and up and down and all this stuff like because it's 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 sweet and awkward, I guess. Then that that's that just sends that home. I wonder if but uh, but really though when he said oh kiss a girl then I think she did that just to hide the fact that she'd probably rather kiss a girl. Oh, she just she just I felt mean, a little attacked. <laughs> probably. <laughs> um. Okay. So. Oh my God. So much stuff is happening. Um, Putnam is back on the case and finds Put- their address. Right, because he got he was calling information uh, in that last scene where we mentioned him saying breast. She doesn't even have breast. Uh, he he finds their address. There's three of them in the book, but he strikes Lucky, grabs the first one. He gets Jim and he takes off. This is when the kids, uh, they put a plan into effect where they contact Spanky and all of her, I guess her dad's other trucker friends. Yeah. And I don't know. Did you notice this? Because they they block off Putnam. They, they catch up with him on the highway. They block him off. They all get out of the trucks. Did you happen to notice what was written on the side of Tiny's truck? No, I don't think so. Hawk Trucking. Okay. Have you ever heard of a little movie called Over the Top? Is, is it called Hawk Trucking? It is. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I was like, I was Shared like, I gotta, universe. I gotta check. <laughs> it's gotta be right. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would like this. I would love to see a scene where like uh, Fred Savage just walks into one of those arcade places and like Stallone and his kid are there. He's like, hey, you want, you want to wrestle him? No, you want to play my kid brother at video games? I'll play video games. Yeah, okay. But you gotta arm wrestle me. <laughs> you got, you got arm wrestle. Oh, I gotta you arm gotta wrestle. arm wrestle my kid. Yeah, I gotta arm wrestle your son. No, you gotta arm wrestle me. I'm the champion. <laughs> I got my own. I got my own truck because I went over the top. Wait, wait, you're an adult man, and you want me to arm wrestle? Yeah, come on, get what you some kind of pussy. Just put your hat on backwards. You can do it. <laughs> so, Tiny gets out of the truck. There's a whole line of truckers who have blocked Putnam off, and he says the line, "So you touched her breast, huh?" How is Putnam not dead in this scene? Right? As a group of truckers, they would murder him. They would murder him. And bury him in the desert outside arena. Because I think we're to assume that she told them that he really did that. Yeah. And if that's the case, Putnam would be six feet under (laughs) after this scene. Not yeah, just like the, have a black the other eye. trucker code. You don't talk about when you murder pedophiles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if this is your okay. first night murdering a pedophile, you have to fight. <laughs> you have to fight. Uh, there's for there's there's a scene where I think it's where Putnam's outside like a Seven Eleven or something like that, and I was just marveling at the idea that there was a buck sixty seven for a six pack of Pepsi at that time. Shit. Right, you can't even buy a bottle of Pepsi for a buck sixty-seven. Say, not even a not even a six hundred milliliter bottle. That's right. Um, and so, uh, Spanky is uh, he he's you know I'm gonna he says, I'm gonna take you kids to the rest of the way to L.A. to California to get you to video Armageddon, ignoring the fact that he is now transporting minors across a state line. Yep. <laughs> Family, it's all about family. It's all about family. You, they remake this today. Vin Diesel is spanky. Oh God, no, he would. No, he would take the Fred Savage role because he'd want to be in it the whole time. <laughs> but I still want Jenny Lewis to play the girl. That's kind of weird, Vin. It's like, oh no, it's it's all right. We'll we'll be on our knees like Gary Oldman and tiptoe. <laughs> But it won't be offensive because we're not little people. We're just, kids. Just make me look like a little kid. <laughs> okay, man. That's uh, not the creepiest thing you've ever said, but it's up there. It's up there. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, then, and then so the yeah they he brings them to the to the big Nintendo tournament. The guys at the front of the of the uh, at the at the front of the building letting people in the, are the fucking register. pieces of shit. 
<laughs> they are the biggest assholes of all time. And you win the tournament on cocaine. Yeah, you win the tournament. Yo, you win the tournament. You gotta get the tournament. You gotta get in the building if you the fucking tournament. Yeah, yeah like, no, move, co- move, 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 move. Oh, what totally. Are we playing Ninja Gaiden. Hey, yeah. Oh, good. Jimmy's played that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So get in there, get in there. You're late. Move, 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 move. I'm like, fuck, dude. A lot. He was clearly on at least an eight ball. In 1989? <laughs> yeah, right. In California? <laughs> what? No. Yeah, so he goes in there and like a bunch of people are, a bunch of kids are already playing the games. Yes, Lucas is is having his go. Uh, the other uh, finalist we meet, Maura Grissom, who yeah. I feel bad for this girl. Like she gets a, She gets a name credit, but she doesn't say a goddamn word. And she and she's uh, a girl that's playing video games, but they also make sure to make her like super nerdy, big glasses, braces, the whole deal. Yeah, I know. She just can't be some average, you know, girl with poofy bangs from the eighties. Now anyone, uh, I mean, now professional wrestlers are great video game players. So oh, Christ, yeah. <laughs> um. All right. So uh, yeah, we get to see all that, and then. Um, of course, uh, Jimmy gets to play. He does great. So we've got our three finalists, Moira, Lucas, and Jimmy. Uh, so they got to take a break. Um, and, but they, they find out that when they come back, they'll be playing a game uh-huh. that nobody has seen before. <gasps> oh. A brand new game. Oh. So they go outside, and uh, this is where we meet uh, Tommy McGuire. Uh, is is hanging out in the background with his super awesome mullet, uh, Lucas, who I don't know how he has friends, because he treats them so shabbily. But I'm guessing they they stay as friends because well he took them to California. Yeah, it's also like that movie trope though, where the bully has like their underlings that they treat like shit. Yeah, I think he calls one of them. He's like, it's like, why don't you make yourself useful, dork lips, and get me a drink? Yeah, I would be like, you know what, go fuck yourself, Lucas. <laughs> But it's such it's such a trope, though, you know. It is, yeah. Like, it's, it absolutely. I is. don't. I don't understand because I don't. I. I haven't really seen it in. I have seen like bullies gang together, but never really the bully treats their other bullies like shit. Like they're usually but pretty chummy. Usually, when that happens, though, there's a comeuppance where that the kid who gets treated poorly, uh, kind of he turns on. The, the head bully and helps the but that doesn't happen in this well I'm pretty sure Toby Maguire's name gets mentioned at one time I believe someone says Peter <laughs> no because <laughs> he's in California not uh, Forest Hills New York this is a very quick uh, excursion <laughs> yeah uh, yeah like pff, like Uncle Ben and Aunt May could afford to go out to California <laughs> he ran away like Jimmy yeah right I'm clear across the country <laughs> Oh, um, I just kept we, running. <laughs> he's playing Tobey Maguire, not, not Tom Hanks. Wait, he didn't play that role? <laughs> nope, not at all. Um, I watched that movie wrong. <laughs> uh, the, Putnam gives chase because Lucas alerts him. He sees Putnam and alerts uh, alerts him to that, you know, Jimmy and, and Corey and all of them are there. Uh, so they really, they chase uh, through like the Universal tour uh, ride. We've got the the tour guide who's being like funny and stuff, saying they're filming a movie with Pee Wee Herman and Zsa Zsa Gabor. Gross. And I'm, it's like, I don't know. I I think I would have paid. To, I I would have paid to see that on video for sure. It's <laughs> <laughs> a big Pee Wee Herman fan back in the day. <laughs> um, and but they, they this oh, this chase. Well, I don't know it's so much a chase because they, they jump on the tram and they go into the King Kong ride uh, where uh, Sam and Nick follow as well. Uh, also, uh, uh, Sam. speaking of Sam, Sam McMurray uh, and Christine, that's the mom, they've made their way to California as well and they're giving Putnam ship because he hasn't found their kids. He's like, you said you'd have them within hours. It's been three days. All that. Uh, he they, they, they make chase. Uh, Corey and, and Jimmy and Haley managed to escape with the help of actually of Nick and uh, Sam because they're trying to you know Sam just wants to beat up Putnam I think at this point yes uh, they jump off the tram and walk like go running around under the ride to which I noted they would have been killed by the hydraulics 
because King Kong is not a small ride. No. Uh, and and uh, the amount of hydraulics that are used in that it, that they they would have they would have died. Well, in real life, but not in the movie because we got to get to video Armageddon. Because that would be really dark if that happened. <laughs> it would have been. He just abruptly ended and the credits started rolling. So we get to video Armageddon. Um, and uh, Corey and Haley and them, they're all high note in, in the area, but they're not down on the stage where they had to be. The the uh, coked out announcer, oh. not to be confused with the coked out uh, registration guy, uh, introduces uh, Moira and Lucas, who give each other like death stare daggers. To wit, I noted they are destined for wedded bliss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he introduces them. He he introduces Jimmy. He's not there. He does it again, but he's not there. And then finally, while well, the stage starts opening up because the game's about to start, and just just as they're opening up, Putnam is upstairs chasing uh, Haley and Corey and all them. They managed to make their escape in an elevator, and to wit, Putnam rightfully says, What the hell is that? <laughs> Which lowers Jimmy right into the spot that he needs to be in. I don't know why that and elevator's there. I don't know either. And, also, and when it opens, Jimmy's in the in center stage in the most dramatic reveal entrance since, oh, fuck, I don't know, any time the lights ever turned out and came back up and it was The Undertaker there. <laughs> also, like, it would have been funny if, like, because he was supposed to be in his, like, spot. Before the doors opened, it would have been funny because yeah. the doors opened. The host is like, oh, there's Jimmy. But it would have been funny if the doors opened after the countdown. And he said, hey, it's Jimmy. I'm sorry. That's not where you're supposed to be. You're disqualified. Disqualified. <laughs> he has to go back to Utah with no money. And but then, no, and, that's not what and happens. Then Lucas and Moira just get married. They find out the game. What's the game, Nathan? The game we don't know anything about. The brand new it's game. It's Super Mario Brothers 3. <gasps> and you have to play it using a joystick, which is bullshit. Fuck that shit. You know how hard do, that game is to play with a joystick? I would do terrible. Everybody would do terrible. You need that you need that that dog bone controller. That D pad's gotta be there, baby. Hell yeah. So alright. So let's get to the it's game on. And um there's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff that's coming up that really That really even, it doesn't, so as a accurate. kid bothered me. So even accurate. as a kid bothered me. Because there's a points where Corey and Haley are shouting out about secrets in the game the game that they haven't seen yet oh you mean when they're yelling get the get the warp whistle yes and even though this game is literally appearing for the first time I believe appearing in this movie before it was even released to the public IRL uh in in America yes yeah the only explain away thing that I can think about is is that at some point along their travels, they there was a, a there was a Nintendo Power issue where they talked about the upcoming Mario Brothers three game and had screenshots. But you think if that was a thing, they would have included it as a scene in this movie? And they don't. Yeah, but they do have weird like things that like. Again, yes, things that don't make sense because the game doesn't exist, but also things that aren't even true because they're like get the star. Get the mushroom. Like I get, I get because they're when he's playing the matching game and oh, all yeah, that stuff. The, the, but like, but like the points are weird. Like it's like whoever has the most points. Like I think that's a weird way to do. Why not just have them say whoever gets the furthest in the game? Well, that's how Video and Arcade Top Ten back in the day on YTV used to decide whoever is the farthest wins. But if you're both on the same world, the person with the most points wins. Sure. Okay. That's and that's an absolutely fair system. Mm-hmm. But no, this is all just points, which actually says to me, like, if someone could figure out a way to, to spam just jumping up and down on a shell like you do at the end of uh, World uh, 3-1 in Super Mario Brothers, the first one, you could just sit there and get point after point after point and win by doing absolutely nothing at all. <sighs> Jimmy gets killed by a boomerang brother, which I would have just noted, way to go, stupid, I thought you were good at video games. Um, and then there's several times, several times where someone dies and has to go back to the start of the world and it's world three, I'm uh, sorry, it's level three of world one, but the announcer keeps saying it's level two. And I got so angry more than I should have. I should probably talk to a professional about this, but 
he kept saying, and she has to go back to level, the beginning of level two. And I'm like, it's three. It is three. Also, fucking Jimmy uh, gets a flute and he, because apparently he knows where it's at. But the next thing they show is him coming out of world five, level five rather, of world one. And the flute is not in level five of world one. It's in the first, like, you know, pre-castle. Where you gotta fight the boom boom, but you don't fight the boom boom. You have your, you know, your tanuki suit or a raccoon feather, and then you fly up and you go and you get the, the thing and it ends the castle prematurely. Nathan, 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 Nathan. You, you want you want to hit this shit? Here, hit this shit. Just just hit it. Just hit it. You feel better? You feel better? That's smooth. Is that a indica? Is it a little bit of calm A, a little bit of calm B. Oh, it's a hybrid. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Just like a car. Okay. All right. You good? Yeah. You all right? I think I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. So super accurate uh, video Fuck! games. <laughs> um, but of course, just like a good finale of a sports movie, Jimmy wins. <laughs> he does at the last possible second. And he gets a bunch of points by warping, which I don't think is a thing. No. The points don't make uh. any sense for the most part. Yeah. Especially because when he gets like sent back to the previous world, you can see it like puts him back in the in the scoreboard, but his score doesn't change. Well, your score wouldn't change. It you're just halted because you're not scoring anything. But why would they push him back in the scoreboard if his score is the same? That I don't understand. That I don't think it's so much that his he's being pushed back is that they're continuing to to, to keep scoring. I guess so, but it was, I don't know. Anyway, whatever. It was weird. It doesn't matter because Lucas and Mora lose. Lose like a couple of losers. Right. And, and Jimmy even, wins. Even Putnam is cheering him on at this point. Yeah. I know I, that kid. I know that kid. <laughs> Do it. Uh, he should not be allowed in that crowd at all. There, no. Just, no. He should have a permanent ban from that crowd. It was at, it was actually at this point where I realized that Vision Skate also must have had a pretty big hand in the sponsorship of this movie <laughs> because all of Lucas's posse have Vision Skate shirts. Corey had a Vision skateboard. There were a couple other people wearing Vision Skate clothing and then for some reason I think at the end even Jimmy's got like a Vision t-shirt on. I'm like that's you know what people complain about this being a Nintendo commercial but I think there was the, the product placement, you know, finger could be pointed in several different directions in this movie yeah um and that surely the movie ends there on a happy note right no no uh we uh we we get the the drive back from california to utah which i don't know what kind of time that again steven is he hit us up with that how long did it take you guys to go from california to utah i mean that's what we want to know here Mm -hmm. um as they're driving along, uh, singing a song side by side, uh, they see, uh, I don't know, like a, a roadside attraction. One of those, you know, two-bit tourist traps that Christian Slater was talking about earlier in the movie. And uh, Jimmy, the lunatic that he is, unbuckles his seatbelt on the highway. You maniac. Buckle up for safety. <laughs> Starts flicking, pounding at the window, saying, California, California, and somewhere... Somewhere, Anthony Kiedis of the Red Hot Chili Peppers got an idea. <laughs> so I'm going to write a million songs with just that refrain over and over and, again. And maybe Bill Hader when he heard California. California. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, so they all, they, 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 uh, they pull off to the side. Um, and Jimmy, you know, runs off. Uh, of course, Sam sees it he pulls off to the side too uh they go up into the one of the dinosaurs which is an attraction they're looking for jimmy uh they can't seem to find him um and they i did notice that this though before we get to this they left the safety pins on the back of jimmy's shirt because they pinned the number to his back for his the the competition okay he had his number right but apparently when they left they just tore the the number off and left the safety pins on the po- uh, back of this poor autistic kid who probably has sensory issues. Can you imagine one of those things popped off and started poking at him? Good lord, that ride back would be awful. Yeah, it wouldn't just be him yelling California. No, it'd be like tetanus shot, tetanus shot, <laughs> pancakes. <laughs> so, 
Uh, they find Jimmy uh, in there, and he is putting down his lunchbox or memory box, as you said. Mm. Uh, it's got all kinds of. It's got all the it's pictures of Jennifer. Day. Yeah, uh, but it's got pictures of Jennifer, him, and Jennifer, and the family. Uh, there's even a picture of them all together when they were still a family uh, at the foot of the dinosaur. And he, Corey, then kind of parcels together. Is this California? This is what you're always talking about. I guess he just wanted to leave her in a place where she was happy. And it's a really, like, kind of a sweet, touching moment. And until you realize that, you know, two days later, some janitor found that and threw it in the garbage. Oh, yeah, 100%. That's not staying there. <laughs> no, he's not. Um... And the mom, you think it, you would think through all of this stuff at some point, uh, as far as like cliched '80s movies go, it would dictate that um, Sam and, and Catherine would have a reconciliation. She would leave uh, uh, Bateman, aka Sam McMurray, mm-hmm. and reunite with her with her ex husband, and they would live happily ever ever. No, all she says is, "Take our boys home." And we'll talk when we get back, meaning that she's going to be a little more open in regards to their custody arrangement. Mm. But I kind of like that, too, though. Honestly, it's a little it's a more honest ending. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, um, and then and then uh, as they're ending, Haley just uh, keeps kissing Corey and Jimmy on the cheek. And I guess they're a she, throuple now. They, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, she kisses Corey. And she kisses Jimmy. And then Jimmy gives her a kiss on the cheek. And I'm like. Are they just going to drop her back off in Reno and never see her again? Nope. We got an extra kid now. That's how it works. I don't mm, no, You can, I don't think that's... Nathan, I've been through the adoption process. That's not how it works. I think the rule is if you find a child, they're yours now. <laughs> I think... I think it's... If, 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 if that's the case, I'm hiding my youngest in your house someday. <laughs> hey, wait a second. <laughs> you found her. She's yours now. <laughs> If you find a child in another state, they belong to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Feel free to transport across all the state lines. All the state lines with them. Yeah. find It's, it's, uh, the, it's the finder's keeper's rule. Right. <laughs> Actually, I believe that was settled in the case of uh, finder's keepers versus loser's weepers. <laughs> yes. I can't believe the Supreme all Court right. overturned that. That's bullshit. Right? It's garbage. That was that should have been a constitutional right. I know. Codify All that right. shit. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks then Obama. <laughs> then credits. That's the wizard. And my notes will ascend to note heaven to never be touched because this movie is great. <laughs> but uh not to dip my hand a little bit, but uh well what do you say, Brendan? Is this thing worth a watch? Is it a drunk watch with friends? Uh, are you going to attempt head trauma to forget it or avoid it like the plague? Um, I'll say it's a drunk watch. Okay. It's, it's, you know, cheesy eighties stuff. Um, the, the video game stuff being so inaccurate is so funny when you realize that Nintendo basically made this movie. Um, Essentially. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. I'd probably say it's a drunk watch. I, I'm not gonna go for the full throat recommend, but yeah, drunk watch with friends. I will say. What about you? I uh, I absolutely say it is worth a watch, especially if you're you know a, a video game connoisseur of a certain age. Um, this is this is a, a big part of Nintendo history for me, even though it's not even a video game. And surprisingly, there wasn't a video game adaptation of this, which I felt that. I missed opportunity on Nintendo's part to cash in. <laughs> that shocks me, actually. That really shocks right? me. But I guess the movie was enough. Maybe, but the movie didn't do that well, I, I, from what I recall. Oh, see, I don't know. Well, that, that can be fair because I never, I saw it on video when it came out. My my dad was like, "I'm not fucking going to pay, pay in theater money to go see a movie about Nintendo." <laughs> That's fair. No, yeah. I think. Um, I had it written down here. Yeah, the, well, I mean, it made its money back and then some, but it cost six million, and they probably expected it to be huge, and it made about fourteen. So it, it definitely made twice its money back, but they probably expected it to do a lot better. Yeah. Oh. Anyhow, that's that's our takes on it. You guys, uh, you know what? We 
have some bills to pay to keep the lights on and 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 me lotion shoes so uh you guys just stick around and we'll be right back nathan what's all this porn you ordered i can't pay for this what were they thinking you'd love to invest on your own but how well, with Quest Trade, we don't just give you all the tools you need. We also give you tutorials and how-to videos to teach you how to use them. Download the Quest Mobile app today and start investing in your RSP. NPR bot, initiate NPR sequence. Beep. Thank you. We are back. Yes, we are back. And uh now is uh, the time for the uh, the show where we we get a little we get a little poetical. It's now time for the low haiku and and Brendan. Just on the off chance that this is somebody's first episode mm-hmm. of our show, uh, could you please explain to the folks what the low haiku is all about? Seventeen syllables to describe the movie we just talked about for a lot more than seventeen syllables. I'm Casey Kasem here on. NPR NPR radio. That that's odd. You usually did the top forty countdown. Well, if you'd like, I can go through all forty haikus that I've written tonight. That's that's quite all right. Okay. We just, we just need the top, the top one. And uh, oh. if you'd be so kind, uh, please do grace us with your low haiku. Sure. <clears throat> Creepy kid hunter, a Nintendo commercial, power glove, no love. Very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, if you could, your haiku. Yes, yes, yes. Mine is as follows. It's a brand new game. Find all the hidden secrets. Hey, hold on a sec. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. NPR bot. NPR bot, save us. NPR bot, please initiate exit protocol. Me- Oh, Whew. that was close. Uh, it sounded like it was starting to hurt. I was, it was starting to reach up my rectum. Oof, barely knew him. Damn near <laughs> killed him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we have had our talk. We've waxed poetical and... Uh, and our chests. And our chests and you know, our legs and bikini area as well because there's still a few weekends of summer left. Mm-hmm. But um, we have a thing where we're at this place where we don't want you guys just to be like, oh well, Nathan and Nathan and Brendan had their say, but what they had, they must be that must be gospel. I mean, that is, we don't want that happening. We don't. No. no. In, in fact, so much so that we've got a a, a nifty little catchphrase that we uh, that have around here. And what is that nifty little catchphrase that we have around here, Brendan? Well, it goes a little something like this. Don't take a word for us. That's right. Don't don't take our word for it. Uh, Brian, I mean, I can't think that this would have been a huge critical success given that it's about video games, it's more geared toward kids and stuff like that, and it's clearly a Rain Man ripoff. But uh, just, just indulge me. What did the, uh, the critics have to say about this? Well, on Rotten Tomatoes, I will say that only 22 critics reviewed it. Um, okay. But out of those 22 critics, uh, 27%... Uh, uh-huh. liked it. All right. But I mean, I mean, this is definitely, this, again, it's geared toward kids. I there's probably a bunch of like, you know, retrospective ratings and kids love it. I mean, I guarantee you the audience thought way more highly of this than the critics did. Right. I mean, they did, but 59%. Oh, so it's still technically rotten. It's still technically rotten. Okay. But I will tell you, Nathan, that if you liked this movie, you may also like the following titles now available on DVD. Um, <laughs> of course, uh, the classic Burt Lancaster film, The Hallelujah Trail. Never seen it. Uh, of course, the classic Dean Martin film, uh, The Silencers. Also, never seen it. Uh, of course, it. the classic, uh, don't see anybody's name on there, Under the Rainbow. Okay. <laughs> Um, the Disney Plus exclusive uh, starring Bill Hader and Anna Kendrick, Noel. 
All right. That was pretty good. Um, and then a movie which is unfortunately called Illegally Yours. <laughs> Starring Rob Lowe. Is that who... Rob Lowe? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> which... Is that just footage from that Democratic convention? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it might be. Is that Rob Lowe? It is Rob Lowe. Colleen Camp is in it, too. And Harry Carey Jr. Oh, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> I don't think that's the same person. <laughs> it's my son. <laughs> <laughs> but fuck that. Let's talk about what the critics are saying. <laughs> All right. Let's do that. <laughs> um, Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times says, It was only after the three kids arrived safely at the championships that I began to question the ethics of the film, which is, among other things, a thinly disguised commercial for Nintendo video games and the Universal Studio Tour 1 out of 4. Aww. I mean, he's not uh, well, wrong. He's not wrong. No, he's not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Janet Maslin of the New York Times said, Video addicted kids may well find this exciting, but for anyone old enough to stay out later than 9 p.m., it's a distinct bore. Wow. Rita Kempley of the Washington Post uh, says, Hollywood hucksters zap them. I, I guess that's supposed to be an insult. Hollywood hucksters, zap them, have borrowed from Japanese game pushers in this shameless attempt to sucker America's children. Your butt, Rita Kempley. <laughs> uh, your country hero, Chris Hicks, of the Tearest News out of Salt Lake City, wrote, Granted, Nintendo has cornered the video game market, and all the kids in the audience seem to know each game as it appeared on in the screen. But why pander to that Saturday morning commercial television sensibility? Because that's the audience, you doit. Yeah. Sorry. It didn't make a lot of money, though. Double its money back. Of six million. <laughs> Still. Yeah, but I think I think going back to the whole thing where you were like, why didn't they make a video game out of it? It's because I think if it would have been if it had been like a huge success, I think they might have. But yeah. it was just like a pretty good success. Yeah, because um, back then, I mean, video game uh, tie-ins usually came out like anywhere from a half a year to a year after the movie actually came out because they weren't. Uh, the, Atari had been bitten by ET, and uh, so I think a lot of video game companies were like, "Let's see how the movie does before we make a video game about it." Yeah, because as you know, ET huge flop in theaters. Great video game though. Oh god, <laughs> nearly <laughs> fucking killed video games. <laughs> In the home console market, anyways. Uh, okay, my last critic review. Um, I think this is fantastic. Phil Villarreal of the Arizona Daily Star says, I love The Wizard. It's so bad. Four out of four. <laughs> oh, I just got it. Power glove. I thought he was just saying he loved it, and it's terrible, and he gave it a perfect rating. <laughs> uh, well, my last one comes from Sebastian Zavala Khan. And I think he might be slightly biased because he's from Moss Gamers. And mm. he writes, it's turned into a cult classic, especially for video games and 80s fans. The Wizard is pure nostalgia. Uneven and confusing, but fascinating. Okay. Well, that's enough of the, of the people who... Uh you know, tr at least come off respectable most of the time. Now we got to talk about the the real the trash heap, the cesspool, the 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 audience reviews, the um, snake pit. Yeah, that is. But the I mean, audience. this first one here is kind of classy because it comes from David O. Who I can only assume is David O. Yellow from uh, uh, Selma, uh, right? Okay. Who played Martin Luther King, of course. Bro, it has to be. Uh. Yeah, he says he says three and a half three and a half out of stars. Maybe it's from Forrest G. It was a decent movie. That's all I have to say. Well, he's from Alabama as well, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my first, my first one comes from Rick V. Uh, Rick Victor. And they, Rick. Uh, okay, I got nothing. <laughs> right. Okay. Do you like Nintendo, the '80s slash '90s, and fun? Then this movie is for you. Certainly aimed towards kids, but enjoyable by any adult who lived through the era. It's a nostalgia trip through the early 90s pop culture and video game culture of the era. One of the best kid villains ever, Lucas, and his power glove really helped spice things up. I love the power glove. It's so bad. <laughs> Fun premise and a must-see for 
any of you 80s slash 90s kids out there, four and a half out of stars. All right. Uh, Carter L. says four stars. People love to hate on this movie. The story is compelling, and I actually feel like it's real. I like it. Okay. Uh, well, my next one comes from Scott S., and I can only assume that's Scott Steiner. Mm-hmm. And he writes, The Wizard is an amazing movie. It's about a boy named Jimmy. He is autistic and always run away from home because of his mom. And the person who takes care put him in a home. But his half-brother break him out, and they went on an adventure to California. And they found out that Jimmy is amazing at video games. Five out of stars. Well, surprisingly, uh, sounded very educated for Scott Steiner. There was no math involved. Yeah. Except for the five out of stars. <laughs> it, uh, Alden S. just says, this was just an advertisement for the Power Glove half a star. Jesus, he has the point. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, apparently I didn't know this was going on. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, my dad is writing reviews on Rotten Tomatoes because oh. my next one comes from John S., and I can only assume that's John Spavald. Mm-hmm. So it's either my dad or my half-brother. Or it could be John and, Saxon. Well, I'm pretty sure it's, it's, it's they're related to me because okay. they write, Best Nintendo Propaganda Film Ever! Three out of stars. <laughs> Alex K. Uh, gives this film two stars, and the review reads as follows. My favorite film is 1941's Citizen Kane. That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I like to think that's on uh, all of their reviews. Okay. Uh, my next one is... Kind of confusing, but uh, it's from Sammy S. Uh, and they write, A 100-minute Nintendo guilt trip, dot, dot, dot. And yet, it's entertaining. Four and a half out of stars. <laughs> I, gotta t- I, gotta, I, got, I got an update, by the way, about Alex K. Okay. Um, there's at least two other reviews that he says, My favorite film of all time is 1941 Citizen Kane. Uh, on a dog's journey, he wrote, "My favorite American dog breed is the American Golden Retriever." Uh, okay. On the movie called *The Third Wife*, he wrote, "I don't watch foreign language films; I watch English language films." <laughs> oh. <laughs> Alex K. And on the shitty is, zombie the movie, life. he wrote, "My favorite American zombie film of all time is 1968's *Night of the Living Dead*." Okay. So anyway, um, let me find my last review. <laughs> <laughs> okay this is brian b i can only assume is b brian blair has to be um it's my last review he uh, gives it five out of stars 1987 which is not the year this came out i don't believe good year for film the wizard is a prime example roger ebert you're a knucklehead no one <laughs> would expect you to like it at least roger ebert knew how to work a calendar <laughs> <laughs> also, pretty sure Roger Ebert didn't just l- di- like l- liked a lot of populist movies, dude. <laughs> okay. He gave uh, Beauty Shop a three and a half out of four, for God's calm, sakes. Calm down, calm down. All right, well, my last one uh, is, I'm guessing he, he's better at typing than he is at talking, because it comes from Jason V, and I can only assume that's Jason Voorhees. Um... And it proves that he is evil incarnate. He writes, Silly, stupid, and morally unsound. The Wizard is a commercial for Nintendo and Universal Studios and 7-Eleven and Pepsi. I'm sure I'm missing at least one piece of product placement there. <coughs> Chevy. Uh, and Vision Skate. <coughs> but so be it. Dairy Queen. Even, <laughs> even for the gamers in the audience back in 1989, when the hook of seeing the new Super Mario Bros. 3 game would lure in the box office money, this film can't be anything more than a letdown. The story is paper thin. The characters, especially the adults, don't do anything that requires them to be smart, and none of the stories are wrapped up in any satisfying way. 
But who cares? The Wizard is the same category as live action Mario Brothers and Street Fighter flicks. No, this is way better. Terrible filmmaking and uninvolving. The latter may be the worst thing you can say about a movie. One out of stars. Fucking Jason Voorhees with his nose in the air over the wizard. I mean, but when you have a franchise as flawless as the Friday the 13th films, (laughs) with not a dud in the bunch. Not one. Not a single one. Not even when he went to... New York, uh, no, he, Toronto, when he New took York, Manhattan, <laughs> aka New York. Yeah. <laughs> when you see Manhattan for about forty-five seconds of screen time, and it's all B-roll because it was shot in Toronto. <laughs> I think they shoot him walking in Times Square a little bit, okay, for like two minutes, and then the rest hmm. of it is B-roll, and the rest of it after that is Toronto. But anyway, there yeah, you go. there we go. Those yeah, are the reviews. That's it. Hopefully we have the gall to say this is in line with the Mario Brothers live action and Street Fighter. So there we go. That's it. Uh, we have, uh, we've we've uh, we've had our say, and the critics have had their say, and the audience have had their say. Uh, so that's that's the wizard in the can. Wrapped up, put in a nutshell there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're now coming to uh, the latest dance craze sensation that's sweeping the nation. It's what you watching, bud? What you watching, bud? I don't know what you're watching, bud. I'll tell you so. Do, 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 do. So, Brendan, mm. what you watching, bud? Well, again, like I've said in the last couple of weeks, or maybe last week, because I also don't know how calendars work, um, but I am watching quite a few uh, horror movies lately as we're ramping up to October because I'm trying to watch as many that I haven't seen as I can. Uh, so I watched a, 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 a movie called Thesis. Yeah, so Thesis is a movie uh, released in 1996. It's the first movie by director uh, Alejandro Am- Amenabar. Uh, you might know him as the director of uh, The Others, the movie with uh, Nicole Kidman. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a real, it's, I, was, I really like that movie. And uh, Thesis is about this, uh, this um, grad student who's doing this, well, this thesis, on cool. violence in uh, basically like violence in films, she finds this like weird dude who's really into like violence and like not just like you know violent movies but like real violence on films and essentially essentially snuff. Um, yep. And she finds a uh, a film from the library on campus that they find out is genuinely a snuff film. So now they're trying to find out like who did it. Uh, what's going on, if there's anybody else behind it. They're kind of uncovering this like conspiracy thing, and you're not quite sure who's on the level and who's not. So it's 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 a horror movie, but it's also like a bit of a mystery. Um, and it's uh, it, it's really good. And, uh, yeah, Thesis. I think you can uh, watch it. I watched it on some s- streaming service, I think. But if not, so, you know, f- be creative. <laughs> it's like 8 millimeter, but smart. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not as brain dead as Eight Millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> Still love that movie. It's enter- Eight Millimeter is definitely entertaining, and this one's entertaining. Mm-hmm. But this one's like got a better other entertaining stuff. for the right reasons. Yeah, <laughs> the, the scri- script's a little tighter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what about you? What you watching, bud? Well, actually, uh, it's not what I've been watching. What I've been reading. Um, took a little day trip to Moncton, or Monkey Town, as we like to call it around in these parts. And uh, picked up a couple of collections of Tanker comics. And I've been having a, a real fun time checking those out. And uh, for anybody who listened to our Tank Girl episode and was left wondering, did she or didn't she have sex with that kangaroo man? If you read the comic books, she absolutely has sex with that kangaroo man. Spoiler alert. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, actually, uh, Tank Girl Forever, I think, is the one that I'm partic- that I've been kind of, I'm reading now and particularly fond of, which is like she gets superpowers along with Jet Girl and and Sub Girl, and it's a it's a, it's a real fun take on the character. Tommy Tank Girl down sport. Tommy Tank Girl down sport. I would. <laughs> well, there you go. That's what we're watching and reading. reading. Yeah. But what about, uh, what about uh, the Montrose? What's he doing? Oh, well, he's just hanging out in the green room. I can go get him. Yeah, just one moment. Yeah. I will. Hello! It's your good friend Montrose Monkington III here, and uh, just uh, 
Uh, yes, I'm usually watching the Graps wrestling. Uh, I'm thinking of, of of dabbling into the video gaming uh, in in the, in the future, possibly, possibly in the new year. I know it's a, a little early to be making these resolutions, but uh, possibly a thing that's coming as I've gotten some some new equipment and uh, might be possibly doing some let's plays uh, and maybe some uh, well, some live streaming if I can find someone to hold the uh, controller for me, as I have no opposable thumbs. But all that you will be able to see uh, on my YouTube channel, Montrose Monkington TV. Uh, you can be friends with me on the Facebook group Montrose Monkington the Third Esquire and Friends. And finally, if you'd like to tweet at me uh, on the Twitter device, maybe you have suggestions about a, a game that I might want to play or something, or some wrestling or promotion that I might want to watch, uh, you can do that at Montrose the Third. That's the number three RD. Thank you. More later. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Montrose. You're welcome. And, of course, you can find us on all the podcast apps. Our home base, of course, is Age of Radio. Big time. You go to ageofradio.org slash what were they thinking. Find us on Patreon. Find us on Redbubble. Find us on Public. We are on Twitter and Instagram at WWTT Podcast. And, of course, you can find us on Facebook. Just search for what were they thinking. That is where we're at. Nathan, I guess I just have questions about the movie to finish us off well i have seen this movie more times than i can count so fire away my friend okay so just hold on now this isn't really about the movie but i still have to ask you okay okay so like i'm on the third level okay in what uh uh, uh cabin quest okay okay so like not super familiar with it but I, I i got some got the broad strokes i might be able to help you out okay so there's like a goblin right Mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. and and when I go up to the goblin, it gives me the option to use a, a sword, right, a wooden staff, mm-hmm. or a donkey. Okay, and I don't know what to do because I, I do one, and it's like I can't go back and redo it. Well, the thing about this game is that it's one of those weird uh, puzzle quest games where the the answer is not super obvious, and it's actually stupidly explained after you do it. Oh. Now I'm going to tell you what to do. Um, you're going to want to use the donkey. Now, people will think, oh, you use the sword, so you stab the goblin. No, no, uh, because his skin is actually impervious uh, to the stabbing. Uh, You think, oh, no, I'll use the wood. But again, because of the impervious skin, the wood staff is just going to break. If you use the donkey, though, the donkey will then get shocked by the ugliness of the goblin, turn around, and donkey kick him into the next county. Okay, so let me try that. Let me try that real quick. Uh, oh, 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 I just fell down a hole. Oh, no, I'm playing E.T. Oh, what were you thinking? Whoa, 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 whoa. I met you at the grocery spot with the sweatpants looking all kinds of hot at a box of Captain Crunch in your hands. Said, now, baby girl, that's my jam. Ain't the kind of girl who needs fancy things. You like staying up late, playing video games. Got a cherry ring pop that you're only playing in. You take me back like Nintendo, like when we were 10, yo, our hands out the window, wherever we go, you bring me back like it's sorry, like sleepover parties, baby, I'm sorry, but I'm not letting go, you got my heart blowing up, like the shoes with the bones, got my battleship song, and you already know, you take me back like Nintendo, Me scream, I want to take you for a ride in my Superman sheets. Got an old mixtape full of workout songs. Gonna take you to the point, make it all night long. Something about you I can't explain, but man, you got me feeling like a kid again. And damn, you got me crushing like way back when. And you take me back like Nintendo.